This is the first in a series of five videos on the philosophy of Christian education. This is part of the requirement for maintaining certification at Cherokee Christian Schools. It is the completion of this Christian education seminar. Uh, it's part of that requirement. There are other things as well that we will go into later. But there are five videos in this. There will be occasionally times when you might be asked to write in something to uh, answer a question or two. So uh, do that as you go through, and that will serve as the uh, uh, accountability for the fact of you watching this. As we begin this series, there's also a set of handouts that might be available to you that might be helpful for you. Uh, you can download those on the link that's also available on this Edmodo site. Uh, a little explanation about those notes. They're in the format of a two-column notes. Uh, this is not only for your own purpose, but this also gives you some ideas about how you might do note-taking in your own class. This is one helpful way to teach your students to take notes. The left column of the handout and the left column of notes could be where students or where you write down what is said. Just kind of make your own notes, summarize the things that are actually said. But then in the right column, there's space there for you to make comments, for you to make uh, have questions. If uh, while we're talking, if there's something that comes up, you say, well, what's this? Or what about this? Or maybe there's an application that comes to mind. Or maybe it's a place where you draw a diagram of something. Or just anything else that might be helpful for you. Having that in the right column sometimes helps when you have separated the idea of, okay, let's, let me get the content down here, what's on the slides or what the speaker is saying versus what my thoughts are. So this is just one suggestion for you, but that's how this, these notes are laid out. So here's an overview of what we're going to be doing over these five sessions. Uh, in this first video, we'll be looking at the idea of a Christian philosophy as a worldview, just giving an overview of what a Christian philosophy is all about. Then we'll look at the standard of Christian education in the second video. The third video, we'll consider the motive of Christian education. The fourth video deals with the goals of Christian education. And in the fifth video, we're going to take a brief look at several current issues in education. So let's begin now with this session, A Christian Philosophy as a Worldview. And first we need to see the importance of studying philosophy. Uh, we might think, well, why do I want to do that? Uh, the idea is here that philosophy is not just dry, abstract speculations. That's what we tend to think of. We tend to think of Plato and Socrates and people arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. That's not the type of philosophy. If we look at the word itself, philosophy comes from two Greek words that means love of wisdom. And so as we study philosophy, the history of philosophy is seeking wisdom. It's what is truth? What is knowledge? What, how do we understand the world? And as Christians, we understand wisdom here and we think about love of wisdom. Wisdom is knowing how to apply the Word of God to life situations. And so as Christians, we should be interested in philosophy. Uh, because we want to know about wisdom, about how to apply God's Word to everything that we encounter. Also, we need to remember that ideas have consequences. This was a quotation from the conservative political philosopher Richard Weaver. What we think is going to manifest itself, or our belief is going to result in actions. And we know this as Christians as well. We know that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what we have in our heart, what we believe in our minds, is going to govern how we live. And we want our practice of Christian education to have a foundation in the truth. So we want to understand what the philosophy is of Christian education. So now let's begin. We have a diagram here that might help us to kind of understand what we're looking at here as we think about the foundations of a biblical philosophy. And the first foundation we'll look at is Scripture itself. Scripture is the ultimate foundation. We see, first of all, that Scripture is inspired. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 
When it says all scripture is breathed out by God, that's what inspired means. It is the very breath, the very spoken word of God. And so the Bible is inspired. Second, the Bible is inerrant. That means there are no errors in the Bible. Psalm 119, 128, David says, I consider all your precepts to be right. All of God's precepts are right. There are no errors. There is nothing God has said that is in error. And so the Bible scriptures are inerrant. Third, scripture is infallible. Not only does it not contain errors, it cannot have errors because it is the Word of God. Again, think about 2 Timothy 3.16. It's inspired by God, it's breathed out by God, and if we said that it could have errors in it, then we'd be saying that God could be making errors. And if God does not make errors, then His Word can have no errors. And then, Scripture is infinite in application. When we look at 2 Timothy 3.16, you have to follow that up with verse 17, where it says, The man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Notice it says every good work, not just some good works, not just religious good works, but any action we can take that could be considered good is governed by the Word of God. So the scripture is the foundation for all knowledge and righteousness, including our work in Christian education. That's our philosophy of education. So we have scripture as the foundation of our biblical philosophy. Another foundation is God as the foundation. Now, you might wonder why I have scripture at the bottom and then God on top of that. The thinking here is that the way we really know God is through Scripture. So if we understand Scripture, then we're going to understand God. Now, actually, those two go together, uh, but it just helped with the diagram here for me to put it this way. So we'll think about God as a foundation of our biblical philosophy of education. So we want to think about who is God? Well, there's a number of characteristics of God, and as you study uh, the scriptures, you read books, you'll hear a lot of different things about the uh, character of God and the nature of God. Here are just some of the characteristics of God, some of these aspects of his nature. So we have to understand who God is. Uh, now, we might think, well, why does it matter who God is? What difference does it make? And so for education here, we think, well, are we here by ourselves? That's If God is the creator, then we're not here by ourselves. There is a higher being. There is somebody that we're accountable to. Uh, there is a higher authority to us. If man has evolved, if there is no God, then there is nobody we're accountable to. We can do whatever we please. We think, who's in charge? Our view of God determines who's in charge and who really runs things. Um, for education, we think, well, are we just left to figure out on our own how to educate? Or should, is it just based on current research? Now, there's a place for research, as we'll be getting to, but is there a higher standard than that? And, in fact, why would research be valid? There's a lot of educational research being done. If Why would that be valid? if the world is just a chance universe. If everything is governed by chance and everything just happens randomly, then the fact that I do some research and it shows that children learn in a certain way today doesn't mean that children are going to learn that way tomorrow. It, if it's just random, I have no way of knowing what's going to work in the classroom and what's not. If there is a God, though, if there's the type of God we have described, that we learn about in the Bible, then we're answerable to him, and he has set up the rules for how the universe operates. And so we can base things on research and education, knowing that God has an orderly universe. Okay, so that's just quickly there, a view of God. Of course, in all these things, there's a tremendous amount more we could say. But what we're looking at here is just giving an overview of a Christian philosophy. I had a course in seminary that uh, was three semesters long on the history of philosophy. 
and even that was just a a run, a quick run through his, through philosophy. But uh, we're just getting an overview here. So we have our foundation of Scripture and God, and so now we start building on that foundation. And one thing that we build is our view of man. So we start thinking, okay, who is man? Who is man? What is he like? Is man a plant, an animal, or is he the image of God? Is he created in the image of God? Genesis 1 says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So man is made in the image of God. Now we think about what an image is. An image is a reflection. You look in a mirror and you see your image in the mirror. That's a reflection. It's not you. It's a reflection of you. There's similarity, but not identity. Okay, the, the image in the mirror looks like you, but it isn't you. It's not identical. Uh, and similarly, if we are then in the image of God, we have similarity to God. We reflect him in many ways, but we are not identical with God. And then we read that man was made, the part of the aspect of him being in the image of God is that he has dominion. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So man is to have dominion. This was a part of the aspect of being created in God's image. Okay. Some other things we can think about with man. Man is created. We didn't evolve. We are not eternal. Uh, we had a beginning and we were created. But also, we know from Genesis 3 that we are fallen. Man is sinful. Okay, man is not the way he was created. But also, God has redeemed man. There's this threefold picture of man that we are created, fallen, and redeemed. And so all three of those come to bear in our education. So we think, well, why does this matter? Why does our view of man even matter at all? Well, for one thing, it affects our view of the teacher. The teacher is created in the image of God with dominion. Then that means the teacher can be in charge of the classroom. If the teacher is just on equal footing with the students. If she does not have dominion, then why should she be in charge of the classroom? It's just because she's bigger and older. Uh, why not just have a purely democratic classroom where everything is subject to a vote of the majority? Uh, but the fact that the teacher was created in God's image with dominion means that she can be in charge of her classroom. It affects our view of the student. How we view man affects how we look at our students. If students are just animals and not made in the image of God, then it's appropriate to do behavior modification. Uh, when you train dogs, you do behavior modification. You do stimulus response training uh, where you give them a treat in order to get them to behave a certain way until it becomes a habit with them. Well, if our students are just animals, then that's how we should treat them, and it would be appropriate to treat them that way. However, if our students are created in the image of God, then they are responsible beings. They're responsible for their learning, and we can hold them accountable for their learning because they are made in the image of God. So, foundation there of man. Our next foundation we look at is epistemology. Okay, big word here. Epistemology. But epistemology just means how do we know? The, it's the, the idea of studying how we come to know things is epistemology. And throughout the history of philosophy, some have said that we learn, we know things by experience. You see the color of the wall around you. You hear the cars going by. 
you touch things, you experience things, okay, that that's how you come to know is through experience. Others in the history of philosophy have said we come to know things by logic. You use your mind, you reason things out. Uh, one classic example here is where they say, okay, experience might mislead you. You know that if you have a glass of water and you put a pencil in it, if you look at it, it looks like the pencil is bent in the middle where it crosses the water line. Now, your logic, your reason tells you that is a straight pencil. And so you use your reason to figure out why it looks bent, why it doesn't match up with your experience. Okay. So that's uh, the age-old understanding of philosophy. Do we learn by experience or do we learn by logic? The problem is that both of these are fallible. As I said with the example of the pencil in the water, your experience might mislead you. You see something, you hear something, and it's not what the actual case is. It can mislead you. Your logic can mislead you. If you have one wrong thought somewhere, you can head down a trail of thinking that is totally wrong. So your logic can be fallible. However, as Christians, if we understand that we are created by a sovereign God and that that God, who knows all things, has revealed things to us, then we have this foundation for experience and logic. You see, my experience can be valid because God created me. He created my eyes, my ears, my sense of touch, all those things. He created them with the world in mind so that when I see something, it's generally reliable. That that's what is really the case. Now, like I said, there may be exceptions, but it's generally reliable. Or my logic. When I think of things, I'm using a mind that God has created. And God has revealed the truth to us. God knows all things perfectly. That's what omniscient means. And so he has revealed things to us, so therefore we can use logic and reason with these things. And so the creation by God and the revelation from God is a foundation for learning by experience and learning through logic. So why does this matter for us as Christian educators? Well, it's obvious. We're in the knowledge business. That's what school is all about. We want our students to know things, and so we need to understand how we come to know. And if we understand how our students come to know things, then it leads to an understanding of how we can teach them effectively. If we know how they learn, then we can better understand how we can teach them. So an understanding of epistemology is important for education. Okay, the next foundation of our biblical philosophy is ethics. A study of ethics. That is, what is right and wrong. Okay. And so we have to understand, biblically speaking, how do we know what's right and wrong? What determines what's right and wrong? Maybe it's laws. We have the Ten Commandments. Okay, thou shalt not, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Uh, there are laws that determine what's right or wrong. But there are also motives. What's your heart attitude like? I mean, the Bible tells us that we are to act out of love for one another. You have 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. So we are to act in love. This is our motive. And if we're not acting in love, then uh, we're not doing right. Or we might think about the results. What are, what are the outcomes of what we're doing? Are we doing something that's going to lead to a better outcome? Think about what Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The outcome of our actions should be a promotion of the kingdom of God. So we start thinking, and philosophers have gone back and forth between these three. Uh, laws, you had Immanuel Kant with his deontological approach to ethics. Uh, you have motives, you have those who emphasize acting in love. You have results, situation ethicists, Joseph Fletcher and so on, who say that the only thing that matters is what's what helps the situation. Um, with the motives, you had existentialism of Kierkegaard, 
So you have these different approaches to ethics, and what we see biblically is that all three of these are needed. One example I've used often is to think about you're going downtown Atlanta, and here's a poor homeless man on the street, and he asks you for money. Okay. Well, you might say, okay, I'm going to give him some money because that's the right thing to do. The Bible tells me that I should take care of the poor. So I'm following a law there. Okay. But let's say that I give him the money, but my motive is, you know, when I do that, I'm thinking, you know, I walk down this street every day. I see this same poor guy here. I'm going to give him some money just to shut him up so he'll quit asking me for money. Well, if that's your motive, we would say you're not acting properly. That's not a biblical response to give him money just to shut him up so he'll quit asking you for money. Okay. So your motive has to be proper. But what about the outcomes? Okay. I give the guy money. Maybe I give it to him in love. And so I have the right laws. I have the right motives. But the guy is going to take the money and go to the local liquor store and buy uh, alcohol or go buy drugs. And I know that's going to happen, but I'm saying, well, I'm going to give him some money because I love him and because, uh, you know, that's a good thing to do. Well, I've promoted a bad result, and so I haven't done a good thing if I've given the guy money and I know he's going to end up just getting drugs with it. Uh, so you have to have all three as Christians. You think about what are the laws, what are the motives, what are the results. So that's a quick understanding of ethics. And so we think, well, why does this matter in Christian education? For one thing, it affects student discipline. We think about how we're going to discipline our students, what's right and wrong as far as their behavior is concerned, how they should live, how we should live around them. Uh, behavior matters. And so uh, we need to understand what's right and wrong biblically. And we're going to teach our students about Christian living as we give them instruction how they are to live. We want to have a biblical understanding of ethics. So, we've seen the foundations of Scripture, of God, man, epistemology, ethics. Our next part of the foundation is eschatology. Okay, another big word. You may have heard it and you may be scared that I'm even bringing it up. But uh, I'm not talking here about getting into the whole idea of premillennialism, postmillennialism, dispensationalism, pre-trib rapture, and all those other types of things. I'm looking at a broader view of eschatology here. We're thinking, what does the future hold for us? What's down the road? Okay. We can think about it personally on an individual level. What does the future hold for us? Well, we're going to die. Okay, it's a downer, but that's the truth. We're all going to die. And after this, the judgment, we're told in Hebrews. It is appointed that the man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. But we also have the resurrection ahead of us. So this is personal eschatology. These are the things that we have coming in the future for us. We are all going to die. We're all going to be judged. And everybody's going to be raised from the dead. We can also think about eschatology cosmically on a worldwide basis. The fact that God is even now summing all things up in Christ. Everything is heading towards that goal of victory in Jesus. Uh, that Christ is going to reign. He will reign forever and ever, as the Hallelujah Chorus tells us. So we have victory, Jesus. So this is a basic understanding of the future. So we think, well, why does this matter for education? Why does a view of eschatology make a difference? Well, for one thing, this life is not all there is. Uh, our students often live as if it is, though. Instead, they and we need to live in the light of eternity. You see, we should be thinking always, what decisions I make, actions I take, have eternal consequences. And so I should live in terms of that and not live as if, when I die, that's the end of me. We also know that history has a goal. We look into the future and we see that all of history is heading for a purpose. It's not just endless, meaningless cycles. 
of history, as some philosophers have said. Instead, everything is working out uh, to the summing up of all things in Christ. And so we know the end of the story. We know where all things are heading. So, we've got those foundations of our biblical philosophy. Finally, a foundation is general revelation. General revelation. Now, this is distinguished from special revelation. Special revelation is scripture, particularly. But general revelation is the revelation that God gives to all men, whether they are believers or unbelievers. So, with the knowledge of unbelievers. I mean, we look around us, and there are unbelievers all around who know a lot of stuff. So what about that? If they're unbelievers, does that mean then that everything they know is invalid and wrong? Well, the Bible teaches this idea of common grace. The scraps that fall from the children's table, for example, that Jesus spoke about. That even unbelievers have a knowledge of God. God graciously gives them this, that they have this knowledge of God, as Romans 1 tells us. So they do have knowledge of this. However, we have to view that through the grid of biblical revelation. The Bible helps us remember, remember, helps us to understand all things, all truth. And so we have to look at whatever unbelievers say and interpret it according to the Bible. So why does this matter? Why does this affect us? Well, students are going to learn much in common with unbelievers. Our students learn that 2 plus 2 is 4. The pagan students at other schools learn that 2 plus 2 is 4. Our students learn that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. So do the students at the public school, even if we might disagree with them about the effect of that discovery upon Native Americans. But there's a lot of things that our students learn that people everywhere learn. And so we think, well, how does that, how do we view that? Uh, well, this is the idea of common grace. Even the unbelievers can understand truth about our world. However, and even unbelieving educators can help us apply the Bible. You see, as we read what unbelievers say, they may have insights that help us to understand what the Bible teaches better. You see, God has created the world. He's created it in a certain way. And if unbelievers are going to come to any knowledge at all, if they're going to function at all, it's going to be in terms of God's world and God's word, even if they don't acknowledge it. And so if they come to an understanding that 2 plus 2 is 4, that is only true because the God of the Bible is true. Whether unbelievers acknowledge that or not, the fact that they can say 2 plus 2 is 4 is founded upon the truth of God. And so there may be other areas that unbelieving educators can help us apply the Bible. So here's our foundations of our biblical philosophy. We base everything upon Scripture and our view of Scripture and our view of God based on that. Then we have understandings of man, epistemology, ethics, eschatology, and general revelation. So this is an overview of a biblical philosophy as it applies to education. Now, in the notes section of your iTunes U course, I'd like for you to think about these following questions. There are two questions here. Just jot down some notes for your own benefit. Think about how much of a Christian philosophy is something you directly study and how much of it is caught as you study the word in general. You see, you might do a detailed study of Christian philosophy. But also, as you just read the Bible, as you study the Bible, as you draw closer to the Lord through the Bible, you're going to have your philosophy strengthened, and you're going to have it corrected. And so you think through, okay, how much of your philosophy is something that you have directly studied, and how much of it just kind of flows from a general study of the Bible? Similarly, how much of a Christian philosophy do you present explicitly to your students? And how much of it just undergirds what you teach and do? Do you tell your students explicitly, here's what the Bible teaches about the nature of man? Now, maybe you don't use those exact words, but you're teaching them a biblical philosophy. 
or a philosophy of ethics, right and wrong. How much of it do you just explicitly teach and how much of it is just a part and parcel of your daily actions, of what you simply do and teach every day, that you are teaching from the perspective of a Christian philosophy. That will conclude this session and then we'll pick up again with session two dealing with the standard of Christian education in our next video. Thank you.